down our crowns. We throw them at your feet. And we reverence the King of Kings. And we reverence the Lord. If you 
don't have an answer to that, I'm trying to tell you today that the reason why God has you here is because he wants to take you deeper. That God is trying to break you out of this mentality of thinking that you have to come to church to get this. That he wants you to take what you get today. Take it home with you. Impact and change the world. Because you carry his presence. What happens here is a manifestation of when we collectively bring it together. And an unbeliever goes, now ain't no way in the world. You're in a place called Club Climax. Where they do everything in here and God consistently comes in this room. Obviously. Obviously God is trying to do something beyond us. And can you help me touch the to focus in on his presence. Don't worry about what happened before you came here. It doesn't matter in this moment. It doesn't matter in this moment. In this moment, it is all about him. Corporately, one more time, can we lift our hands and lift our hearts? Some of y'all lift your hands and try to lift your hearts. Lift your hands and lift your hearts in this breath.
gravity of this moment. Because there are some people that have never, ever, 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 ever had a touch with God. And there are some people that don't even know that God is real. And if they were to walk in this room right now, in a place that they thought they probably wouldn't even meet God, presence of the Lord is here. His presence is here. And we reverence His presence. And we thank Him for His presence. Let me pray one more time. Jesus, we ask you today that as I declare your word today, that you be magnified. That God, that uh, you help me deliver today. You help me deliver with the power of God what you have to say to your people today. I pray that you are exalted. And I pray, oh God, that your people come into a greater relationship with you as a result of the word that is delivered today. In Jesus' name. Come on, give God one more hand praise, everybody. Then your presence is heaven to me. Heaven is in the room right now. Heaven is in the room right now. Thank you, Jesus, for heaven being in the room. With Jen on the bar, heaven is in the room. <laughs> when people was breaking, pop locking, percolating, all kind of stuff in here, Jesus, you're in the same room. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I mean, think about it. Right here on this stage, rappers, people from all across this world, right now, standing right here in this stage, and nobody compares to the man that is here right now. Nobody compares to the matchless man in the name of Jesus. Right. Listen, before I get into my message today, of course, we all, you know, saw the news yesterday with uh, Trayvon Martin, the case. And I want to go ahead and say this just from the beginning. Go ahead and say it. Get, out of, get it out of the way and then move on from here. Um, you know, yesterday... Everybody's kind of been watching the case and all they love and everybody has their different opinions. Everybody's, you know, an expert now. Uh, you know, social media somehow makes us all experts. And it's interesting to me how, you know, we probably only have watched CNN and we've getting all of our details about the case from CNN. Let me go ahead and just say this from the very beginning, regardless of what side you are on, that we must understand that as believers, we stand on God's side. Point blank. I stand on God's side. There is a law that supersedes the law of man, and that is the law of God. And I live by the Bible. I do with the Bible. I believe what the Bible tells me to believe. I don't tell the Bible what to believe. That's true Christianity. You get to a place where you don't tell the Bible what to believe. You let the Bible tell you what to believe. And when he moves, you move just like that. And so I believe that in this situation... Uh, where everybody has their opinion about the, this court case, I believe that we just need to learn how to walk in the grace of God. Yeah. And the one thing I want to say is this, as I posted a tweet, this is all I said about it, is I don't want us to be one-hit wonders when it comes to situations like this. And like the great Dr. Martin Luther King said, that injustice anywhere is a great threat to, in, to justice everywhere. And so you must understand that if you're going to stand up for one of them, stand up for all of them. You're going to stand up for all of them. If you're going to post a tweet on all of them, or on this one, stand up for all of them. Don't just become what the, the crowd does and what the crowd says and what CNN says and what Facebook says and what Fox News says, and then that's what you jump on. I need us to be engaged completely in what is going on in our world so that we can bring impact and influence. And let me go ahead and just say this from the very beginning. What if George Zimmerman walked in the doors of our church right now? How would you react? And what would you think? And then I'll tell you where you are with God. Case closed. <clears throat> so I need you to understand this, that I don't hate nobody. Because Jesus don't hate nobody. I love who God loves. And I stand on God's side. And I don't stand before you today as a politician. I stand before you today as a pastor. And I stand on God's side. And I say, God, this is what it is you asked for us to do. 
and how you ask for us to think, and that's what we're going to do. I'm going to love my enemies. I'm going to love those that I don't think that deserve the love. I'm going to forgive those that I don't think deserve forgiveness. I'm not taking anything back from Travion's family. Pray for his family. And if you haven't said one thing of prayer and you've done more posting, then you really out of sort anyway. <laughs> so let's get into a place where we pray for the family, but we believe the best. And we ask God to be the vindicator, not man. God, you take care of it. And you, God, if it's in the hands of God, then it's going to be taken care of. And so that's where we put the situation today. Amen? Amen. We put it in God's hands. Amen. All right. So today I'm going to do a message entitled Dip Baby Dip. <laughs> Look at somebody say Dip Baby Dip. <laughs> yeah, I know, y'all. I'm not talking about the Tootsie Roll. I'm just I'm going to use that for um, I'm just going to use that for a title today. And the, the message is not going to be very easy. So I need you to kind of hang in there with me. But I think you'll get the point once I'm done. Dip, baby, dip. If you're going to be tweeting, make sure you tag me in your tweets. And Antoine Jackson, tag the church in your tweets at Equation Church. Hashtag greater so that we can see what it is you're posting. Now, I don't know about you guys, but this series has been pretty incredible to me. Uh, I go back and I watch the service and listen to the messages myself. Like, it's been like that in incredible, like just the information that has been going forward here and just really just positioning us and changing our mindsets and our mentality about what it is God has called us to do. Like it's just been one of those things that's just been pretty incredible. And it's been awesome to see the transformation that's been going on in y'all lives. I've been seeing us kind of go, like we come to another place where we're not tripping off of that old stuff and what it used to be. We're actually focused. <laughs> we focus on what it is God has called us to do, and I really appreciate that. And last week, man, I believe it was really awesome. Like I said, I watched it six times because it, it was interesting to see how God just works everything together for the good. Just like the Shunammite woman, how God worked that situation together for her good. It didn't look like it was going to turn out good, but then God somehow, he just came around the bend, and he just worked that situation out for your good. And I'm here to encourage you, he's still working it out. For your good. And then we must understand this, that just like the shooter might woman, we sometimes have to understand that we have to trust God through the hard times of life to see the best side of life. That we have to learn how to trust God through the hard times of life to see the best side of life. That if you want to see the best side of life, you've got to weather your storms. You gotta, and you've got to put on your big boy pants, put on your Superman outfit, and weather the stuff. Quit being a punk about life. Quit that stuff just knock you out of the box. Quit letting people give you a bad attitude. Quit allowing the situations of life to change who you are. And stand and see the salvation of the Lord. You've got to learn how to trust God. Don't be a wimp when things go on in your life. Trust God in the hard times of life so you can see the good side of life. There is good ahead of you. The best is ahead of you, but you got to learn how to weather the storms, as we saw last week. And we understand that we have to learn how to trust God with our faith, because we know that God won't waste our faith. We know that God is too faithful to waste our faith, that anything we give to him, he's not going to waste it. He's going to keep it, and when that time is right, when your faith is matured, then he's going to, bam, hit you. It's just going to come out of nowhere, like, man, I've been waiting on this, I've been looking for God to do this, and then all of a sudden, that trust fund is then matured, and then he's able to release the blessing and the greater that is on your life. Amen. Amen. So I, I've really been trying to encourage you through this, this series because I'm trying to get you to understand that there is greater for you. There is something better for you. But today I must have a real talk with you. And today it must be one of those things that you have to hear. You like, you have to bypass your flesh today because your flesh wants to scream when, when I get done with what I have to say today. But you must understand that I am trying to get something and inject something greater in you so that the greater can come to pass in your life. And is it possible, y'all know this, that, that it's possible for you to be too great for your own good? Yeah. Bishop, you... Nine weeks you've been talking about all of this greater and everything that we're supposed to be doing and then all of a sudden you want to come around with this sucker punch about, you know, I can be too great for my own good. I, I'm not trying to sucker punch you, I'm just trying to balance you. I'm trying to balance you because I need you to understand that there are some times in your life where you can't be too great for your own good. You can't feel yourself a little bit too much. 
And when you feel yourself a little bit too much, then you can't pull you out of the will of God for your life. You can't have a little bit too many likes on your Instagram and you too many retweets and too many likes on your Facebook where you start to feel yourself. You might be taking a little bit too many selfies in your life because you're feeling yourself, but I'm trying to help you balance yourself so that you can see what it is God is calling for you to do. Say, hang with, hang with me, Bishop. Hang with me. Hang with me. So have you seen so many people that are just so, they're God-driven, they have all of these God-given talents, but they sabotage their own life through one issue, and the issue is called pride. Can you say pride? I was like, well, Jesus, Lord, have mercy. I'm so glad that you manifested yourself in the way that you did today because this message ain't easy to preach because don't nobody want their, their pride to be touched. And honestly, this is still in track with the series. This is not out of the series. This is on point with the series because you must understand that if the greater is going to come to pass in your life, then you have to deal with pride because if you don't deal with pride, then guess what will happen? The greater won't come to pass in your life. So on, on this journey to the greater, you must understand that you'll never know a greater life without humbling yourself to the greater one. That you'll never know the greater life without humbling yourself to the greater one. There are so many people that don't understand that pride is the enemy to your advancement in your life. That pride is an enemy to the advancement in your life. That you must understand that this series has been entitled, has been trying to balance you, to get you to understand that there is a journey that you have to do. There are things you have to do. But you have to understand that if you're going to get to your greater, there are two things that will make you get there or that will stop you from getting there. It is your perspective and your motivation. That if your perspective is that God can't do it, then he can't. And that's what we've been working on all the way up to then. But now today, I want to deal with the issue of the greater, and that is your motivation. What is your motivation for what it is that you do? Because if your motivation is not to give him all the glory or to give him all of the honor, then the greater won't come to pass in your life. And I'm telling you that there are so many people that are wanting God to do so many wonderful things, but they haven't done the first thing, and that is humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. Amen. Yeah. How you view things, my friend, will keep you from getting to your greater or keep you at your greater. And also the motivation of your heart will either get you to your greater or stop you from getting to your greater. Y'all with me? I figured y'all was going to be a little quiet today, but it's all good because I'm trying to get this into your heart today. That we must understand this, that Jesus is the only true standard for greater. That if we don't look at the things that God wants us to accomplish in our life, and if we don't see Jesus at the end and we see ourselves at the end, then our motivation is wrong. If I can say, I got this, I did this, I accomplished this for my glory. We may not ever say that, but at the end of the road, we don't see Jesus. We see me operating in my talents, my giftings, my abilities, me accomplishing everything that I want to accomplish, but it's never about Jesus. It's about my relationship. It's about my money. It's about the people in my life. It's about my job. It's about my ability. It's about my business, but it's never about for him. For him. And God says, well, hold on now. Hold on, my friend. I got to get you to a place where you get balanced because you must understand that it is about him. And if we don't understand that it is about him, then we sabotage the greater in our life. And what I'm so excited about this place is because I'm in a room full of humble people. I know that there are people in this room that understand that it is not about them. Yeah, that is, it's all about Jesus, that in him they live, they breathe, and they have their being, that they understand that in life it is not about what they can accomplish, it is about what they can accomplish through him. Remember, I can do all things through Christ, which gives me the strength. So if he don't give me the strength, I can't do it. The reason why so many people check out on life is because they're trying to do it through their own strength. You got to bench life. You got, it, you, got, you, got a, you got a level that you can only do in your own strength. But if you're going to do the supernatural, if you're going to do the greater, you need his super. You need his super on your natural. You can't do it in your own strength. You need God's ability on you to accomplish the greater in your life. Say amen. amen. I'm preaching good, but y'all quiet. Thank you. Here's the paradox here. Here is the paradox of this entire series. Here is the paradox of this entire series. That the greater we become in God, the less we focus on our own lives. That the greater we become in God, 
The more God elevates us, he raises us up. The more he does for us, the more he provides for us. The more he sets us in path for what it is he has for us, the less it actually becomes about us and the more it becomes about him. That we understand that the things that we accomplish in life, it has nothing really to do with us. We're just vessels. God is just using us to accomplish his plan. Any real believers in the room today? To accomplish his plans for our life. So the higher you go in God, you must be willing to go lower because you must understand that the greater purpose is about him being reflected in what you do. That the greater that he releases on you is so that he can be reflected. Remember, it's about platforms. Remember, influence here is not about your name being great. It's about God being great. And the reason why God can never promote us to places and platforms where we can have true influence because our motivation is about us and not him. The reason why some of us will never be able to be judges so that we can actually judge righteously is because the motivation of our hearts and the way that we do our jobs right now. Because some of us, we must understand that you can't change the world through Facebook and social media, my friend. You got to be sitting in those seats. You got to have on that judge role. You got to be standing behind that desk as a lawyer to be able to make impact and change. But you got to have the motivation of your heart and what you do right now. Oh, man, I'm helping y'all today. I, I wrote this in my message. Some of y'all will come back and you will thank me. You will kiss me 20 years from now. When you're in the place of destiny, when you're in your place of greater, and you will say, Bishop, thank you so much for not being the easy church. Well, everybody thinks it's the easy church. Where well, don't nobody really tell me the truth, the reality of what it is. Yeah, I want to speak to your potential and tell you that there is greatness for your life, but there is a process, my friend. There is a way that seems right to man, but it, at the end of it, it is death. And if you want the greater to come to pass in your life, then you have to submit to the process, say humility. 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 So I'm going to narrate another story for you that I'm going to get out of your hair here. In 2 Kings 5, in 2 Kings 5, we find here a man named Naaman. And Naaman here was the captain of the army of Armin. Aram, I'm sorry. And so we must understand this, that he actually wasn't an Israelite, and the Lord actually helped him win the battle. That he wasn't even an Israelite, and this is Old Testament here. It's funny, we've been walking through the Old Testament, y'all even paid attention to it. That this man was not even an Israelite, and the Lord helped him win the battle. And we must understand this, that even in spite of all of his success, all of these wonderful things that he had going on in his life, this great captain had two problems. And I want to address those with you today. The first problem he had was the problem of leprosy. And leprosy was one of those decapitating kind of diseases that you couldn't be around people. It was almost, it is equivalent to what we would call AIDS today in, in how people receive it. That it is one of those diseases that nobody wants to touch, nobody wants to talk about, nobody wants to deal with. It is one of those things that disfigures you, it disfigures your skin. It, it is just a bad disease to have at that time. But that was his number one of his problems. But the second problem he had was the issue of pride. Say pride. Yeah, pride. So Naaman here, he goes to the prophet Elisha's house because he hears that this man can do some miracles. So he goes to Elisha's house and he takes all of this stuff. He goes fancy when he goes to Elisha's house too. He goes with horses. He goes with chariots. He goes with servants. He goes with silver. He goes with ten sets of clothes. He goes with all of these gifts so that he can pay Elisha for, for the gift, for the healing that he thought that he was about to receive. And the Bible says here that he actually stopped at the door. He was expecting for Elisha to give him the royal treatment. He stepped at the door. He thought Elisha was going to come to the door and be like, oh, this great man Naaman. I'm going to do whatever I need to do for you. What Elisha did is he sent a servant. <laughs> Elisha said, hey, man, Gehazi, go, go heal him. Go tell, give him the instructions of what it is he's going to do. Naaman gets upset. He gets mad. The Bible says here in 2 Kings 5 and 10, it says, but Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. He says, go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. So Elisha sends the servant to him to tell him to go to the Jordan River and dip in the river seven times and he would receive his healing. That's why I got the message, dip, baby, dip. He says, go dip seven times 
in the Jordan River. It is equivalent to me saying, Aaron, you want to be healed of leprosy? Go down to the dirty Mississippi right there in front of the, the arch, and I want you to dip in the Mississippi seven times to receive your healing. Naaman gets upset. He's like, hold on, player dude. I am the, I'm, I'm the captain of the army. I'm, cat, I'm awesome. You mean to tell me that, first of all, you send a servant to me? You, ain't, you, ain't, you can't come to me yourself? And then you, send, you tell me to go down here to some dirty river and to dip in this river seven times? You got like messed up, player. Ain't, no, ain't nobody got time for that. Know who I am? I'm not going down there to dip in no river no seven times. And he gets furious here. But here's a hard truth for you. If you have walked with God for a long period of time, you know that God will ask you to do some things sometimes that you absolutely don't want to do. See, this is for the mature. If you, if you ain't mature, hang in here for a little bit. But you've been walking with God a little while. I've been walking with God since I was 15, man. So it's been a while. And God has asked me to do some stuff that I absolutely don't want to do. This past Thursday, I got up in the morning. My, I didn't want to go to I didn't even want to go to work that <laughs> Thursday. And I got out of bed and God was like, don't go to Starbucks this morning. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. He said, don't go to Starbucks this morning. Don't go to Starbucks this morning. I need that in my life. Don't go to Starbucks this morning. All right, I didn't go to Starbucks, okay? Went to work. I mean, this ain't the, the, the blessing. I mean, this ain't the message of it, but I went to work, and then guess what? I ended up with two Starbucks free that day. That ain't the message, but <laughs> I kind of want you to walk out mad at me today. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like, man, there are some times when God will ask you to do some stuff that you just don't want to do. When you've been walking with God, you're like, man, come on now, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go dip in no dirty river seven times. Can't you just, can you just lay his hands on me and I just receive my healing like that? Can't the prophet just speak to me and I receive my healing like that? God says, no, I need you to actually go do the thing that you don't want to do. Because your blessing in your life is tied to you actually doing the thing you don't want to do. I just gave some of y'all the key to your breakthrough. That the key to your breakthrough is actually the very thing that you know God is telling you to do that you don't want to do. So you praying? Stop praying. You fasting? Eat a, eat a Big Mac. Obedience is what God has called you to do. Because you must understand that on the other side of your obedience is the other side of your destiny. Say amen. So, yeah, God says love everybody. We don't, we don't disagree with that. Love everybody. Love everybody. Love every single body. But God loved George Zimmerman? I don't know about that. No, I don't know. I don't, I don't know about that, God. Um, for, I can forgive anything. I can forgive. I can forgive them for stealing, but I can't forgive them for murder. Yeah, send me, Lord. Send me, Lord, to wherever you want me to go. Send me to the nations. Okay, I want you to start in East St. Louis. <laughs> Paul, they ain't feeling me today. They loved me for the last nine weeks. Today they got their stomachs. But we must understand that obedience is better than sacrifice. And some of us are doing all of these things for sacrifice. And you must understand that you don't even have to pay that price. That if you would just walk in a place of obedience, say obedience. So why is it that God seems to ask us to do things that just seems to be beneath us? Why is it that he would ask us to do things that seem to be beneath us? Why in the world, God, would you ask me to move a chair? Why in the world, God, would you ask me to sweep a floor and set up a foyer and set up children's ministry? Why, God, would you ask me to clean up a club and turn it back around when the service is over? Why, God, would you ask me to feed the poor? Why, God, would you ask me to clothe the naked? That's beyond me. That's beneath me. Why would you ask me to do stuff like this? Why would you ask me to give a ride to the person that I don't even I don't really like? Why would you ask me, God, to give my last dollar? Why would you ask me to do stuff like this and here? is the crux of the entire message here. That the key to walking in the greater is connected to obedience in the areas of life where we're locked into patterns of resisting God's spirit. 
that the key to walking in the greater is connected to obedience in the areas of our lives where we are locked into patterns of resisting God's spirit. The very thing that we're going back and forth around the mountain about, if you would just stop the cycle, then you actually would see progress in your life. You know your knucklehead uh, relationships, you know your knucklehead husbands and wives that y'all don't want to submit to each other, and that same pattern is going on in your life, guess what? If you reverse, reverse the pattern, you might have a wonderful relationship. Because when you don't want to deal with it is the time God is calling you to deal with it. And the time when you don't feel like saying a mumbling word to him is the time when you need to say good morning. All the married people say amen. And the time when you know you need to save your money instead of spending your money on ridiculous stuff. See, the key to walking in the greatness is connected to obedience in the areas of our lives where we are locked into the patterns of resisting God's spirit, the very thing that God has called us to do. Now, understand that to me, the Starbucks was small. To God, the Starbucks was small, but it was a test of my obedience. That it didn't necessarily have to correlate to a blessing on the other side. It had to do with my mentality to obey what it is God has asked me to do, big or small. Big or small, will God go to church on a Sunday morning? Yeah, your blessing might be connected to that because you're too, you're too self-absorbed all week. He needs one day in your life. Y'all all right? Yeah, because God doesn't want to feel like he's second place, so he challenges our obedience to see exactly if we really love him, if the motivation for the things that we're doing in life is for us, or is it about him? Do we want him to be pleased or do we want to be pleased? Is it about our satisfaction, how I feel, how good I look, how many likes I get, or is it completely about him? I'm about to get done here in a little bit because y'all about to stone me. I see spiritual stones coming up here now. <laughs> that your success in life is found in you doing the things that you don't want to do. Bottom line. That the things that God is calling for you to do, that, that the success and the greater that God has for you is actually found in you doing the thing that you don't want to do. And so basically, the easy part for every single one of us is to go home and say, you know what, that's the thing I don't want to do. That's what God is calling me to do. And so what the enemy does is he tries to paralyze us with fear. He tries to paralyze us with insecurity. He tries to paralyze us with what other people think. And guess what? Those par that thing that paralyzes you keeps you stuck. Ain't nobody. Is there anybody here that's ready to move forward? Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't become a believer to play games. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't become a believer to play games. I didn't become a believer because it was the fashionable thing to do. I'm not in the church because that's what everybody does on Sunday. I'm here because the motivation of my heart. I love God with my heart, my mind, and my soul, and my strength. And because of that, I give him my all because I love him for what he's done for me. It's not competition. It's not bad. It's not because it's the thing to do or because I like this church. It's because I love God. And so because of that motivation of my heart, then God is able to bless. So can I suggest to you that some of you guys, I promise you, will walk up to me in the future. You will hug me. You will kiss me. You will bless me because you will say, Bishop, thank you for the opportunity to clean the bathrooms. You will thank me because you will go, thank you for the opportunity to allow me to dip. To dip in the Jordan River, to dip in the place where nobody thought. Thank you for the opportunity. I walk up to my pastor so many times and I go, Bishop, thank you so much for the opportunity that I got to serve. Because those opportunities that I got to serve was the gateway to me being right here. To be in the greater and then also positioning for what it is God has called me to do. Thank you. Didn't like it then. Didn't like the time spent. Didn't like getting up early and staying late. I didn't like the energy that was exerted. I didn't like the work, period. But at the end of the day, when my heart caught up with what it is I was doing, I understood that really wasn't the issue of the physical work. It was the issue of what God was doing on my heart. Can I suggest to you that God is doing a great work on your heart, my friend? That's why he got you here moving chairs and setting up, because it ain't got nothing to do with your physical strength. It got everything to do with your heart. Because God is trying to get humility. Say humility. humility. Oh, Lord. This message is as popular as preaching about money. <laughs> people don't want you to touch their pride, and people don't want you to talk about their money. But today we're going to deal with both. 
Because it's important that we understand what God is calling for us to do so that we can see the greater come to pass in our life. So to prove this point here, Naaman, his servant, says to him that is very interesting to me, and y'all are all catch this in verse 13. He says this, he says, and his servant came near and spoke to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more, he says to you, wash and be clean. So basically, his servant came to him. The servant of Naaman said, listen, man, had he asked you to do something great, you would have done it. Had he asked you to turn a trick, you would have done it. Had he asked you to go kill somebody, go, go, go do something crazy, you would have done it. But what he said to you is not what you wanted to do. And so that is the very thing that kept you stuck from receiving your miracle. Can I say to some of you guys, and I say this with every passion that is within me, that your miracle is on the other side of you doing the very thing that you don't want to do? I'm trying to help you today. I'm trying to get you to a place that you understand here. That your miracle is at stake here. That you need to do the thing that you don't want to do so that the thing, the greater that God has for you comes to pass in your life. And I'm sure the reason why you're here today is because you don't want to be stuck anymore in life. You didn't come here today for me to lie to you. You came here today because you want to hear a word. You want to hear the truth because by the truth you are Set free. Mm, I'm going to have to be my own amen today because this is not popular. <laughs> By any means. He says, man, I, he asked you to do something that you didn't want to do. And you didn't do it. But if it was great, you would have done it. So you mean to tell me, well, Bishop, if you ask me to set up the foyer every single week, that I won't do it? But if you ask me to preach, I would? I'm talking about the motivation of my heart. I'm not talking about the work. I'm not talking about the work. I don't matter what it is. I'm asking you about what is your heart response? What does your heart do? What does your heart say when you're asked to do something that you don't want to do? In your own life, on your own job, in your own relationships, when you're asked to do something that you don't want to do, how does your heart respond? And if your heart responds in the wrong way, then it tells you exactly where you are. And you need to crucify pride. Say crucify pride. Here's a pride test right here. Y'all ready for this? Y'all sure? All right. If you only participate in things that only benefit your greatness, it is a sign that you haven't found the greater way yet. This is the acid test for pride. That you only participate in the things that benefit your greatness. It makes you look awesome. It uh, benefits you. But you don't participate in the things with full heart and strength, in the things that don't even give you any glory, but it helps glorify God. That is the acid test for pride. So that you're in a place where you say, well, God, I mean, I know that it looks like something that it won't benefit me, but at the end of the day, it actually does benefit you because it puts your heart in the right place to receive the greater for your life. So let me say this, that... This message is not intended to embarrass anybody, nor is it intended to put anybody on blast. But what this is intended to do is to make you love God deeply. It is to make you put yourself in the mirror with him and say, Jesus, you are my standard. That Jesus, if I'm going to see the greater come to pass in my life, then I got to measure up and I got to say, okay, God, I got to obey what it is you call for me to do. And I'm trying to get you today to actually do, just put like a death blow to your pride and say, I'm going to put this thing on the altar and I'm going to crucify it. I'm going to get involved in the things that may not even benefit me from the start, but because I know it will benefit my heart, I'm going to get in it. Yeah. Say amen. Yeah. <laughs> dip, baby, dip. <laughs> Dip, baby, dip. So understand this as I'm coming to a close here because y'all sleep on me. That your destiny is in your dip. That's all I need you to remember today. That your destiny is in your dip. That remember, I told you the reason why I got here today was through humility. It was coffee and it was vacuums. That my destiny was in my dip. That it was in my service. It was in the vacuums. It was in the serving in the local church. It was serving the men of God. It was doing the things that God called me to do toward my wife and my kids that I didn't want to do. Spending my money on stuff I didn't want to spend it on because God said. Blessing people that I didn't want to bless because God said. Because God was trying to get me to dip. 
because my miracle was in my dip. It was in that place of humility and service that God began to do all of these things. And what I'm trying to do, guys, I'm trying to get you, I'm trying to help you exchange here what the world would suggest is greatness, and I need you to pick up what God says is greatness. I need us to understand that if you're going to start from the bottom, starting from the bottom in the kingdom of God is a place of humility. Amen, Bishop. I'm about to play my own organ. Because I'm preaching good. It's good. Sometimes you got to drink the Kool-Aid. Sometimes you just got to drink it. You just got to be like, you know what, this is bitter, but it's going to help me. Pepto-Bismol sucks, but guess what? It works. <laughs> Humility and dealing with pride is not easy, but it works. And you say, well, God, I'm trying to get to my next place, and you think it's through work. See, what I'm trying to do is break the performance track. Because what some of us do is we try to perform more. We try to do more. We try to act like, oh, I'm so this, I'm so that. And God is saying that in this season of your life, it is not really about performance. It is about the posture of your heart. That's where this is. Where are you with your service? Where are you with the things of God? What is your Jordan River? What is the thing that God is telling you to go dip in? What is the dirty mess that God is saying go dip in because in that you might find your miracle? I have never seen diamonds at the surface. You've always had to dig deep for diamonds. And if you go, and if you're gonna be something precious, you got to dig deep. You gotta get in there, you gotta do whatever it takes to get in there. You gotta dip and you gotta go forward and you gotta go down. Even more that you understand that God, if I'm gonna get higher, I gotta get lower. Come on, is there anybody here that understands? Because some people in the back don't. But is there anybody here that understands that if you, whatever you did, what God has done for you is good because you got low? Because I got low. It's because I got low. It's because I humbled myself under the mighty hand of God. And in due time, he will exalt you. And you're asking God for all of this stuff and God has said, oh, just all I need you to do is get low. All I need you to say is it's not about me. It's all about you. It's all about your glory. Now understand this, that Nathan was a good man. He was an honest man. He, I mean, he wasn't a man that was full of sin. All the above the Bible doesn't really say that. But it, you must understand this, that it is not about our glory. It is not about our comfort. It is not about our pleasure. It is not about our greatness. And it is not about our anything. It is about his everything. Come on, is there anybody in the room that understands that it is about Christ? It is about him. It is about him being exalted. I don't care how great it is. I don't care how big it is. If it's not about him, he's not in it. But is there anybody that's not going to live in life? And it's not going to be about Christ. It's going to be about Christ. It's not going to be about me. It's going to be about Christ. But I'm not going to live my life for my own pleasure, my own gain. But I'm going to live for him. My last point since y'all sleep. The lower you get, the higher God can take you. And if you're plateaued in life, here's my suggestion to you. Get lower. David, am I lying? That if you feel like you're plateaued in life and you're stuck and you can't seem to get any higher, I'm not telling you to go higher. I'm actually telling you to go lower. Because you must understand that when you get down and you humble yourself, that's why we humbled ourselves today. We got down on our knees. Because God is up there. Why in the world would you get down on your knees? Because guess what? When you get down lower, God comes to you. Woo! Jesus. And you're trying to go to God and God is trying to come to you. When you get down lower, God begins to descend. So you say, God, I need you in my life. Get down lower. Humble yourself. Don't be like the prophet Naaman that sees this Jordan River and sees it dirty and says, I'm not going to do that. And then eventually he got over his flesh and he went into the river and he did seven times. And guess what? God healed him of his leprosy, but God also did another miracle. He changed his heart. He got his miracle. God healed him of leprosy. He's now socially accepted. 
He can now post his pictures on Instagram and people will like it. Because <laughs> they like, dude, it's ugly. Not no more. People don't like his pictures now. But also, his heart is right to God. So now, because you must understand this, that pride is really found in the root of insecurity. Because when you don't know who you are, you put on this front like you do. And everybody can read through it and know it ain't. Humble people are secure people. We understand who we are in God. We understand that God fights our battle. I don't have to defend myself. God got me. All I got to do is learn how to live right. All I got to do is do what it is God has called me to do. God defends me. And I may be talking to some of you guys that's trying to fight battles in this room. And you wonder why your marriage is going through. Stop fighting and let God do it. You wonder why your money is going through. You keep trying to let God do it. You wonder why that boss is giving you troubles. Let God do it. <laughs> because you got to learn how to humble yourself and step. You're trying to fight the battle, but God wants to fight it for you. Yeah. The battle is not yours. I preach some good messages, and this one is the best one. Because this is the motivation of our heart, my friend, not a motivation of getting stuck. And if the church is going to have the influence that God has called for us to do, we got to get back to a place of wanting him more than we want our own stuff. We got to get back to a place where we want him to be glorified more than we want to be glorified. We want to get back to a place where we want him to have more lights than we have more lights. Three claps. Look at somebody say, dip, baby, dip. Dip. Baby, dip. You need to dip. Go find your Jordan River and go dip in it. And dip in it seven times until it's complete. Don't just do it one time. Oh, I'm just going to obey. I'm just going to do it one time. No, 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 no. The reason why I had to do it seven times is because each time he had to make up his mind he was going to keep doing it. <laughs> First time, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Second time, okay, I better, I better do this. You know, you got to keep doing it until it becomes a part of who you are. It has to be a part of your DNA because there's so many people, and I'm talking long today, and I don't care. <laughs> that there are so many people that from the outside appearance, they want to put on this appearance like they're humble people, but you can read through it because it's not a part of their DNA. Because at some point, they're going to say something, do something, have an attitude that shows you they're insecure. At some point. And you must understand that as you continue to take the bath in humility. That's what this message is. As you continue to take the bath in humility. Seven times dipping in it. Then greatness begins to come to pass for your life. And so that's why I don't stand before you today as a politician. I stand before you today as a pastor. Saying baby it's time to dip. If the greatness is going to come to pass in your life. You need to get in that Jordan River. And you need to dip. You need to serve. You need to move a chair. You need to do something because your greatness is found in your dip. Come on, give God a hand, praise everybody. I wish we could play the song and everybody start dipping. <laughs> Dip to that. Dip to that. <laughs> because I'm trying to get you to understand something that I'm not trying to take anything from you. I'm trying to get something to you. Just as he did to the prophet, he's like, dude, just go dip in there seven times. And you must understand that if you're going to walk into a place of obedience, if you're going to walk into a place of humility, then radical obedience is what follows. It's quick obedience. It's okay, I'm going to do it. I ain't, I ain't, I'm not going to fight about it. I'm just going to do it because I understand that my destiny is attached to it. So Lord Jesus, I pray today. <laughs> oh Jesus, bless your people. Pray, oh God, that they understand that humility is a virtue that we should all ascribe to because we want you to be glorified. It is no longer about us, God. We take ourselves off our mind. And for the greater to come to pass in our lives, we put you on our mind. That we want to see you at the end of our journey, not our things. We want to see you at the end of the journey. We want to be able to look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. We want to see you high and lifted up. And so today we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God so that we will be exalted in Jesus' name. Come on, give God a hand praise. Don't clap your hands, great and good enough. Ah. Listen, if you're here today, you need a relationship.
relationship with the Lord Jesus. Let me help you understand something, that you will never know greatness in life without knowing the greater one. And there are so many people in life that are trying to live life by their own strength and you have a bench life. But there is a man named Jesus that you must reverence and you must submit your life to. Jesus not only wants to be your Savior, but he also wants to be your Lord. And not just somebody that you can just pick up when you want to pick up, but he wants to be your Lord. He wants to be somebody that is reverence that can give you instruction and that understand that he will lead you into the path, the path and the purposes and the plans for your life, but you got to follow his direction. And you must understand this, that guess what? The one thing that I don't have a fear of is the fear of hell. Because I have a relationship with the Lord Jesus, so I ain't even thinking about him. My eyes are fixed on eternity because I have a relationship with Jesus. And if you know that you, if you close your eyes to the last time and you won't see Jesus, then you need to get saved. Bottom line, you need to give your life to Jesus. You need to humble yourself. You need to say, okay, I can't live life on my own. I got to live with Jesus. I need to give my life to Jesus. And then also, if you know that, man, I need to be a part of a local church that challenges me. Some of y'all like cute church a little bit too much. Y'all like cute church a little bit too much where there is no challenge. I don't want to be a part of nothing where there is no challenge. Why go to a gym and they don't need the weights that I need? They don't have the weights I need to get stronger. Think about it. Do you pay to go to a gym to have a membership for them not to have the equipment to get you to where you need to be? Well, so why do you go to a church that don't have the equipment to get you to where you need to be? I call it diabetes church. A lot of us like diabetes. We, just, we want insulin shots <laughs> to get us through the week and then we're back next Sunday. But no, this is a place of challenge that we will encourage you and push you, but we will also challenge you because you have to be what it is God has called you to be. You can't stay in the same place in life and think you're going to advance to the greater. And what I'm so excited about is this place is going to be full of great people. We're going to be a place full of balanced people. People that are going to have fun in their relationship with God, but people that are serious about their relationship with God, not the religious cute. Go to the church down the street, you want their religious stuff. Here we want a real relationship with God and we want a real relationship with people, and sometimes that's a challenge. So if you know you need a relationship with the Lord Jesus, and you know you need a relationship with the local church, I want you to know that there's going to be some pastors in the back after church. We don't want to put you on blast, but there'll be some pastors in the back after church. You make sure you go to them and you tell them, take responsibility and say, I need a relationship with Jesus and I need to be a part of a local church and I need to make that commitment today so that I can be what God has called me to be. Amen? Come on, give God one more hand. Praise if you will. Woo! Jesus. All right, so we're going to pass you some offering envelopes and let me talk real quick and then we'll be out of your head. Like I talked about earlier, we talked about the issue of money. Now, if you are a guest here and you believe that the church wanted, that all the church wanted is your money, keep your money. I'm not talking to you. But I am talking to those that understand what it is God has called us to do. And before you write your checks, before you make your PayPals out, and before you give online, and before you write your debit credit, I need to tell you exactly what it is we need. We just purchased a new soundboard, a new digital soundboard, so that we can keep our services rolling. And I cannot wait to break that baby out. We're still trying to get it situated. But we just purchased this new soundboard. The soundboard was about $3,200, a lot of money. And then in, inside of that, we also need a digital snake so that we can run it from wherever it is without a whole bunch of cords and wires running straight to the, to the stage so that we can EQ everything and make sure that worship is excellent, make sure that the presentation that comes forward from here is without any hiccups. So that's about $600, $700. We also want to make sure that we keep in step with our regular budget by which we have to meet every single Sunday. And so we need to raise some money today. And so I'm asking you to say to God, okay, God, what is it that I can give? What sacrifice can I give today to ensure that my church is able to do what it is they call them to do? Now, let me give you some testimonies. Your church owes no man. We ain't in debt to nobody, and we ain't sweating about nothing. But it takes every single one of us to do this and bring this to pass. And so I need you to be faithful today. And some of us have been kind of taking the little hit out where we know that, oh, somebody else is going to give. Or the church don't need nothing, so I'm not going to give. Let's not play that game no more. Let's be faithful in our giving. Let's be faithful in our tithe and our offering. And then when your church needs something, you say, God, I'm going to do whatever it takes to do something. So let's raise the money to pay this board off. And let's raise the money to get this digital snake. Let's raise this money so we can keep budget going. And guess what? We'll be back next week. Amen? So write your checks. Make your checks payable to the Equation Church. 
If you're giving by debit or credit, make sure you put your first, your last name, your address, and your telephone number so that you can get proper credit for your giving. If you're watching us via Ustream, you can also click the donate button to your right and you can give there. Take a second if you would, please. Fill out your offering God with open faith, believing to receive what you give. In Jesus' name.
Yeah, baby, yeah.